We haven't heard much from you about Omicron SETI-3, Mr. Spock. I have little to say about it, Captain. Except that for the first time in my life, I was happy. Bridge to all decks. We have a very, very, very special episode of Enterprise Incidents with Scott and Steve. I'm Scott Mance. And I'm Steve Morris. And Scott, I've been excited about every single episode we've ever done on this show, but I am so excited today, not only because I love today's episode, This Side of Paradise, but I am absolutely thrilled with the guests that you've brought in. We have a very, very special guest to talk about a very, very special episode of Star Trek, This Side of Paradise. There's no other episode like it. This is an episode that really does have it all. It's so beautifully written. It's so sensitively directed. And we'll get to who that person is. Uh, But it's a perfect balance of drama, of heart, of humor. You have great performances. It is a It's an amazing allegory for the hippie movement and the drug culture, an allegory that went over my head for many, many years. But yes, Steve, as you mentioned, we do indeed have a very, very special guest saying the word very a lot because very is a word and a half for how honored we are to have our special guest who, in addition to directing six episodes, six credited episodes of the original series. He has also directed TV over the decades, classic television running from The Twilight Zone, Dr. Kildare, 12 O'Clock High, The Fugitive, The Courtship of Eddie's Father, The Partridge Family, The Waltons, Heart to Heart, The Paper Chase, among many, many others. And he made his debut as a director With this very episode, This Side of Paradise, it is our honor, our pleasure. We are so excited to have with us Ralph Sinensky. Ralph, welcome. Thank you for having me. I'm delighted to be here. Well, we absolutely are so excited to have you. And I guess the first question for you, before we get into like the uh, details of the actual episode and our scene scene by scene, play by play, is how did you come to direct Star Trek and was This Side of Paradise, the first episode that was offered to you? No, I I was the first first script that was sent to me after my agents called and told me that they had an offer offer for me to do this new series, Star Trek. And I said, yeah, go book me. (laughs) <laughs> and they, the next day, I got the script for Devil in the Dark. Mm, okay. And I read it, and I liked it. I had The year before, I had done 11 episodes of the FBI, and I really wanted to get away from crime shows and, and that and to get back to the personal kind of shows that I did the first five years when I was directing. I did. Kildare, Route 66, Naked City, Twilight Zone, Fugitive. And then I flew back to Iowa to spend the holidays with my family. And after I got there, I received uh, an envelope with a new script. They said, you'll be doing this script now. And it was uh, The Side of Paradise. And my first reaction was, I was disappointed. Oh, why? I thought it wasn't that much of a science fiction for me. It Mm. wasn't as science fiction as Devil in the Dark. To me, it was just a a modern love story like I'd been doing, except the guys wore funny shirts and one of them had funny ears. (laughs) Were you a fan of science fiction before you came on to Star Trek? No, no. As I've written in my website, when I was a kid, I mean, you know, eight, nine years old, I used to read Buck Rogers in the 25th century every Sunday. Hmm. And four years before, I had directed The Twilight Zone. Right. And I didn't know that was science fiction. I thought I was doing a, a ripoff of Faust. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, I, I came to it to direct a script about a guy who they said was a Vulcan. He was half human, half Vulcan. And uh, there was going to be a change in his life. And the uh, lady that he had had a relationship six years before was involved. And it was that story. And so I was just doing that story. You know, I have to say, it is so remarkable how, for one thing, you know, you thought you were going to do one episode. Devil in the Dark is a very, very different episode than This Side of Paradise. And yet the episode you wound up doing 
you just owned it so much to the point where it is widely hailed as one of the 10 best episodes ever produced of Star Trek across any series, not just the original show. And it is so beloved. And you got to bring to life this uh, wonderful screenplay, ultimately ultimately written by the wonderful Dorothy D.C. Fontana. Right. But, but you, you know, because Devil in the Dark was the first one that was offered to you, that was a Gene Kuhn masterpiece screenplay. So, so how much did you already know Gene Kuhn prior to when you came over to Star Trek? The year before, Gene Kuhn had directed the first The Wild Wild West that I, that I directed. He produced it. And uh, at that time, he told me that because that show was so different that when he, he would hire a writer to, to do a script, they would go home after they'd worked out the plot. They'd go home and write it. When they brought it in, he would do a total rewrite because he said they didn't get it. So I knew that I had directed a Gene Kuhn script. And because and he had told me that. And uh, that was a great experience. It was a great yeah. experience. Yeah, one of the things about Gene Kuhn is that you know he passed away in the mid seventies, so he I never know. he never got to see like what Star Trek became, like this thing that it became with the conventions and the movies and the other shows. So we don't really know much about him beyond his written word. And some some people might say that you know what that's enough, but he really didn't have a chance to sort of bask in the glow of of his contributions. So how would you describe Gene Kuhn as a producer? from especially the first two episodes you did, which were This Side of Paradise and Metamorphosis. Actually, I didn't really know Gene Kuhn that well. I mean, we had a great working relationship, but he was doing his job, and there wasn't that much interplay between the two of us. There didn't need to be. He sent me the script, and I was pleased with it, and I think he was pleased with what he was getting back, and we just weren't interacting that much. Hmm. And it, I regret that now. Well, how would you like to hear some some information about about this side of paradise? Talk away. Well, first of all, as we mentioned, the teleplay was ultimately written by Dorothy D.C. Fontana from a story by Fontana and quote unquote Nathan Butler. Nathan Butler was the pseudonym that Jerry Saul insisted be on the screenplay because his original outline and his first draft were heavily rewritten by both Gene Kuhn and ultimately Fontana. So Jerry Saul, Steve, you'll remember, he wrote The Corbomite Maneuver. Mm -hmm. So this episode aired on March 2nd, 1967. It was the 24th episode of Star Trek to air, but it was the 26th episode to film. And it was filmed between January 5th and January 13th, 1967. The total cost, Ralph, you got to take a bow for this. This came $13,319 under budget. Wow. <laughs> under budget. The episode cost $171,681 on a budget of $185,000. Now, Star Trek back in that day, they were allotted six production days. This episode wound up having a seventh Day added. And Ralph, why did that happen? What happened uh, with co star Jill Ireland while you were already in production on this episode? We started uh, filming our first three days on location away from the studio at the Disney Ranch. And Jill was not booked on the first two days. She was not scheduled to start filming until the third day. And we went out to location the third day early in the morning because our days were short. This was in January. So our lighted days were short. And we got out there and had the word almost immediately that Jill would not be reporting to the location. They feared she had the measles. Oh, boy. And so we finished everything that we could do at the ranch that did not involve Jill and then reported back to the studio uh, to finish the, the day, I don't even remember what we shot that probably on the bridge. 
That's right. Your memory is right on, Ralph. You shot on the bridge. <laughs> I'm not remembering it. I'm just figuring out what we what we must have done with the people we had available <laughs> who hadn't been booked. The fourth day, we still were shooting at the studio when we got the word that Joe would be available. And so then they made the arrangements. We, we couldn't get the ranch back because they were booked. Mm-hmm. And so they made arrangements for us to shoot at Bronson Canyon. And I have to tell you, Jill's getting the measles so that we couldn't finish her scenes at the ranch was a gift. Why is that? The background for the scenes that we did with Jill were so much better Mm. at Bronson Canyon than they would have been at the ranch. The ranch was flat and it worked fine for what we did. But the scenes with Jill and with Leonard, most of their story, except for when they see each other for the first time early in the show and for their final scene. But everything else was was location, and it it was like doing a one-act play out at, at Bronson Canyon. And I'm very, very pleased. I'm really curious, what was the pre-production like? Like, how many, do you know, how, how many days did you have before you started shooting? Were you involved in the casting process? Well, we only had two roles to cast. Right. And, and uh, Jill's name was said to me, and I said, fine, I hadn't worked with her, but I knew of her work. And Frank Overton, I'd done, I directed Frank in four 12 o'clock highs. So mm. uh, there was no problem there. And as far as the other c- crewmen, Joe D'Augusta, who did a good job, and they sort of had a, a list of guys they could bring in to play, to wear red shirts. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, my time was spent looking for the location, and I'm, we didn't have to look t- to too many places to find a location that had the buildings. The, the only one there was Disney Ranch. Gene Kuhn set up some screenings for me to look at some finished episodes of Star Trek. And uh, the schedule for a director was six days of prep and a seven allotted for filming. Of course, we have to ask you, what were your first impressions of the, the Holy Triumvirate here? You got William Shatner, Leonard Nimoy, and DeForest Kelly. The same thing that I would have on any new show, any show that I went on to new for the first time, any episodic series. You just go on and find out what's going to happen as you start to work. Wow, wow. So, so Steve, I know that I've always loved this side of paradise. And I have to say that as we have always done here on Enterprise Incidents, gentlemen, when I sat down to take my notes on this episode while I was watching it, just like every episode Steve and I have done, I absolutely had a new, deeper appreciation for it uh, and certainly some philosophical things to say about it too. And Steve, I know you do too, but I want to know what it was like for you when you saw this when you were growing up. I've always loved this episode. I've loved Nimoy's performance. I love getting, always loved getting to see this side of Spock that never existed anywhere else in the show. It's so joyful. And like you, Scott, it was really interesting watching it this time because in addition to all the fun, man, it made me really sad. Yeah. It made me really sad, this episode. So Jerry Saul wrote his first treatment, okay, on June 5th, 1966. And at that time, it was called Santaval's Planet. So he did a revised story outline about a month later in which the title was changed to Power Play. And then on September 1st, Jerry Saul submitted his first draft script, and it was called The Way of the Spores. Now, about uh, two and a half months later, on November 16th, Dorothy Fontana, DC Fontana, she's credited, did her first story outline that was changed significantly from Jerry Soule's original outline and treatments. But it was Fontana's story outline in which the title for the episode is now called This Side of Paradise. She wrote her second draft script on December 11th, and Gene Kuhn did a second script polish, a revised final draft on December 28th. And as I mentioned, this is the episode that got Dorothy Fontana the job as the new story editor for Star Trek. And and Jerry Saul was, was so upset initially with the rewrites that he he insisted that his name be changed as to a pseudonym, Nathan Butler. And uh, it took a little while for Gene Roddenberry and Saul to kind of patch up their rift. And Jerry Saul did write the third season Star Trek episode, Whom Gods Destroy. And I'm looking forward to doing our deep dive, uh, Steve, <laughs> with you on that one when we get to the third season. But I found the quote that Leonard Nimoy had said at the time 
about his concern with doing a love story for Spock, which was very different from the emotion that he had shown in The Naked Time. He said, I feel like I finally got a good grip on the character and I don't want to lose what we have. Did did Nimoy express any like, hey, heads up, Ralph, I'm concerned about this, or did he just go with it? I knew nothing of any of this that you've said. When when I did the show, I've learned a lot of that since, I mean, like 40 years after. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And to me, Leonard's performance is just incredible knowing that. In, well, when we get to it, the tree. Yeah, yeah. oh, yeah, we'll, we'll get to that. Leonard... Nothing was ever said. I mean, nothing ever I, that I ever asked him to do. He just did it, and he was just doing it so brilliantly. For for an episode that that had something to say about the counterculture of the '60s, Steve, I am assuming that there was a whole lot going on in the world. There wow, this was filmed. <laughs> there absolutely was. So it was so interesting. We always talked about what the crew and the cast were go- hearing on the news as they were heading into work. And now we have the director and this is what was going on. Uh, first of all, this is something I think we talked about in our last episode. They're continuing to be mortars fired across the Israeli-Syrian border into the state of Israel. And again, Israel gives orders not to counterattack, not Mm -hmm. to fire back because they don't want escalation. On January 8th, Operation Cedar Falls begins in Vietnam, and this is the largest commitment of troops so far, 30,000 more troops. On January 10th is the State of the Union Address, and Johnson says this, I wish I could report to you that the conflict is almost over. This I cannot do. We face more cost, more loss, and more agony. Oh, it is it's just a brutal, brutal moment in American history. On January 12th, this is interesting in relationship to science fiction, is a, a, a man named Professor James Bedford died of cancer, and he is the first person to be cryogenically preserved. Oh, not, yeah. not Walt Disney? <laughs> nope. Uh, well, that was, I think, just Walt Disney's brain, I think, isn't it? <laughs> or is it all of Walt Disney? Anyway, uh, he and he his body was housed in uh, Alcor Life in Scottsdale, Arizona, which is still operating. And I believe James Bedford is still there awaiting re- resuscitation. Maybe he has to wait until they send him out on the Botany Bay or something. I was just going to say. <laughs> um, this one is amazing. I never heard about this. This is on uh, also on January 12th. Members of the NYPD saved 300 people in Jamaica, Queens, going from house to house in the 20 minutes before a huge natural gas explosion that destroyed 22 buildings. They got notified at 5.11 in the morning, and the explosion was at 5.30. So that's 19 minutes they managed to evacuate 300 people and save their lives before the uh, explosion. There were only four people even hurt, and none of them was injured seriously. Wow. Hmm. Uh, Shall we get into the episode? Very, very excited. Ralph, are you ready? I'm ready. Let's head down to Omicron SETI-3. Approaching Omicron SETI-3, sir. Standard orbit, Mr. Pater. In that first scene, I did what I will do in any opening scene, is to be sure that the information is heard clearly. Most important thing. Oh, and, <laughs> and many times it's not. Yeah. But but that that's that's a must. And what we hear basically is what the situation is, is there were colonists sent to this planet and they later found out that the planet is getting bombarded with these things called Berthold rays. And therefore, there is no chance whatsoever that any of these people survive. So in the earlier versions of the story outline and the earlier teleplays, it was just that the planet was being bombarded by radiation. And it was Gene Kuhn during his polish he changed it to something more alien called Berthold Rays. So let's uh, organize a landing party and beam down and we're, we see it, get our first look at Omicron SETI-3, which is filmed, like you said, Ralph, at Golden Oak Ranch, which was owned by Disney Productions. So not only are you filming your first episode for Star Trek, but you're filming it on location, like on uh, your outside, by the way, that you had, looks like you had great weather. <laughs> I loved filming on location. This was 1967, four years earlier, 1963. Up until then, I'd done uh, six shows, all of them in in the studio. And my first location show was a Route 66. Mm. I went in for an interview on a Wednesday, got the job, 
went back in on Friday, was given 22 pages of script, flew out that night to Texas and started filming Monday morning. So I was used to shooting on location. What is it you like? You said you like shooting on location. What is it you like about being on location? You just have a a bigger set and uh, (laughs) it's, it's, it's just the vistas are endless. Right. The shooting on location was no problem at all. I always find that actors frequently have an easier time on location because they're just in a real space rather than on a set. That, there are usually fewer pages that you do on location. Mm. And if you're on a location and you have a reasonable amount of work to do, it's very pleasant. It's nice. I mean, you're you're out in the fresh air. Not so nice if you're out in, in the wintertime in cold weather or if you're shooting at night and under those conditions. But right. no, I mean, shooting on location, the vistas to shoot are endless. It, it, it definitely looks absolutely beautiful while they're, they're on location at the Golden Oak Ranch. And we see exactly what we expect. We beam down to the planet with a good-sized landing party, and just as they said, there's nobody there. So obviously, what they feared had happened had happened. Another dream that failed. There's nothing sadder. And they're kind of in this moment of mourning the tragedy of this. It took these people a year to make the trip from Earth. They came all that way and died. Hardly that, sir. Frank Overton played Elias Sandoval. Uh, From film, you would know him from classics like To Kill a Mockingbird and Failsafe. And from TV, he has been had been working uh, for decades since the earliest days of television in shows like the Philco Television Playhouse, Studio One, two episodes of The Twilight Zone, including the classic from the first season, Walking Distance. He was also in The Defenders, 12 O'Clock High, which uh, four episodes of which were directed by our guest today, Ralph Sinensky. So, so Ralph, working with Frank on 12 O'Clock High, how was it now working with him on Star Trek? And did that familiarity make it easier for you? It's always easier when you're working with an actor you've worked with before. Working with actors, it's almost symbiotic. There's not that much discussion. And if, with Frank, there didn't have to be. I would stage the scene and it would be comfortable for what he had been planning. And he, I thought it was sensational. Absolutely agree, yeah. We come back in Act One, and the first thing we hear, and I think this is the very first clue that something is going on. Our subspace radio didn't work properly. I'm afraid we didn't have anyone here who could master its intricacies. The fact that they've been on this planet for years and nobody fixed the radio, that's a real sign of what is happening to these people, I think. They, they do not want to be found. They want to be left alone in their, in their paradise. So the one thing about the Berthold race, there is a, uh, a race against time because it's established that they have about a week before they die from being exposed to these, to these rays. But Sandoval's like, let me show you our settlement. And he heads off. And now we get a great McCoy line. Your speculation, just an educated guess, I'd say that man is alive. DeForest <laughs> Kelly, how magnificent did you think uh, DeForest Kelly was, Ralph? I thought they all were. That whole crew, starting with the top three and the, the next three, Jimmy Do- Doohan, Nichelle, and George, I thought it then, and I think it even more so like this last couple of months where I've watched the shows of the first season leading up to it and how they have evolved into their characters. And I cannot have enough praise for them. And especially the three, the three that were not the stars. That little, so little to do many times. And yet they are so real. And that's mm-hmm. hard. <laughs> Speaking of which, Sulu has a, a very odd line at this point, which was we're talking about. These people shouldn't be alive. Is it possible that they're not? <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know, I know. Can I, t- can I tell you a funny about that, about yeah. that sequence? There was three shots. Bill had had a close-up in the teaser. And uh, as I was staging that, he did ask me, and this is something actors do when they're testing their director. He said, uh, you going to cover this? And I said, no. And he said, sort of shook his head and said, this is television. And I said, Bill, that show uh, opposite you on Friday night at nine o'clock, movies. And, you know, for the next 18 months, the six shows that I did after that, never. He, and he was just testing me, never questioned it again. There's never any discussion. 
That was you, you it, put but... him there. You put him in his place. <laughs> well, no, and I didn't know. He wasn't putting him in his place. I mean, he was testing me, and I was responding. Mm, absolutely. It's funny. I, I, Ralph, I think I mentioned to you that I, I teach directing. And so often I have to warn my students that actors or cinematographers will frequently test them and will take over a set if the director doesn't have the strength to be a leader. And it is remarkable to me that at the level of Star Trek and with your reputation that Shatner is still going to test people. Oh, yeah, he, 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 tests, he tests, would test anybody, I'm sure. Gentlemen, we're debating in a vacuum. Let's go get some answers. I love that line. We're debating in a vacuum. I've used that line many, many times. No one ever, no one ever gets what I'm quoting, but that's okay. <laughs> so we head inside and we hear a little bit of background about the colonists and they've split into different groups. And then we hear Elias. And there we get to see for the first time, Layla, Jill Ireland. So Jill Ireland was seen on TV in shows like The Man from Uncle. And her first husband was David McCallum, who was on The Man From U.N.C.L.E., and she was also on the series Shane. She did 17 episodes of the TV series Shane. She was also in film like The Big Money, Hell Drivers, Carry On Nurse, and co-starring with her second husband, Charles Bronson. She did movies like Breakout, Cold Sweat, Break Heart Pass, Death Wish 2, to name a few. And Steve, like you mentioned, when we first hear Layla Colomi say the word Elias, and then she sees Spock, and the camera zooms in on Jill Ireland. Ralph, I'm wondering if you could tell us about the setup of that shot and about the lighting that the, uh, the great Jerry Finnerman did to capture this angelic look of Layla Colomi. Jill had two close-ups in that scene. The first one was when she said first said Elias and we cut to her and then she walked into closer to the camera and as the camera was going in on her went in on Leonard and then by then she was behind the chair and then Jerry did another close-up of her there and that was the special one because mm. Jerry in addition to what he did on her just lighting her he and he told me this what he was doing he put a small baby spot directly behind her head. She could not move anywhere, anywhere because the light would show. And it's that it's just an incredible, incredible shot. It was. I'm not sure whether I shot that before we shot Bronson or not, but it was when I knew that Jerry was a master. I'm glad you brought that up uh, because. We have sang the praises of Jerry Finnerman many times on this yeah, series. I know you have. We adore his work, and we do think he is a genius. Can you just give us a little more insight into what made him a genius? I think his father was a cameraman. I know he was in the business, but Jerry you know, had been in the photography division of the, the Guild for his whole life. Started as an assistant cameraman, was then the operator for Harry Stradling. I mean... Jerry, as the operator, did My Fair Lady. And, you know, Stradling, who was one of the masters, one of the giants, and as good as he was, Jerry is that good, and Jerry is still did things beyond, especially on Star Trek. I mean, Jerry, Jerry painted with light. Absolutely. But, as the good cameraman did, but he did it beyond what so many, so many of them did. When we started working together the first few days, we, it was a friendly association, and it evolved within this show and then, of course, into Metamorphosis, into an exciting collaboration. Jerry was a dear, close friend till the day he died. Well, what's so interesting to me in comparing Star Trek to other shows at this time, it's just so much more filmic because of the lighting. You know, I loved watching Bonanza. I watched, I, by the way, I love Wild Wild West. That's one of my favorite shows. None, none of these look like Star Trek. Because the lighting is so unique, it really, really changes things. That's true. That's true. And the Star Treks that followed, even the Star Trek that for the first season after Jerry left and was finished by somebody else, it was not the same. You could definitely tell when Jerry was no longer a part, a part of the series. Yeah. But the other thing that, that I love about the scene when we see Layla Kalomi for the first time. So yeah. the music for this episode was tracked. And in this case, Ruth's theme from Shoreleaf 
that became Layla's theme for this side of paradise. And when I hear this beautiful motif that Gerald Freed did for Shore Leave, I think of this side of paradise. I think of this theme more for Layla than I do for Ruth. Steve, you agree on that? Me too, 100%. And, and, par- and partially because Ruth is is not a truly three-dimensional character. Mm. And it is not a real relationship. It's a, it's a fantasy relationship of someone of the past. And this is a three-dimensional relationship. And what I find so interesting too in this moment is Kirk's had a past – many, many times in the series, particularly women coming out of his past. (laughs) Even McCoy had a past in Man Trap. Spock really hasn't. And so it's such a, it's almost a shocking moment when we see that something's going on and we're not cutting to Kirk, that we're cutting to Leonard Nimoy for his reaction to seeing her. I think it's a great, great moment in Star Trek. After the two close-ups of Jill and Leonard, there is a close-up of Bill and at the very yes. end, his eye goes from Jill to it just a, and it's just a flash. The head does move. It's almost like just the eye moves. Just it, it's an incredible reaction. Great reaction. He notices he noticed that there's there's definitely something there that there's a little bit of awkwardness going on between them. Layla, come meet our guests. This is Layla Colomi, our botanist. It's Captain Kirk, Doctor McCoy, Mister Spock. Mister Spock and I have met before. In a long time. And Spock does not answer. Right. It's a really, really good choice. Yes. And then and then as the everybody exits and the two of them are left looking at each other, nothing is said, and then he exits. Yeah, it's really cold. It's really interesting, really fascinating, and really beautiful the evolution in just a 50-minute episode of how Spock and Layla go from being like this awkward and Spock has this coldness to that final moment of the two of them in the transporter room. It's really, really Mm -hmm. just bravura. I have a question and I think it's not only critical to this episode, but I think it's critical to Mr. Spock in general, which is clearly he has a reaction to seeing Layla. Clearly he has some feelings, even in the way he exits and you can see him not speaking. My question is what were his feelings for Layla six years ago? That's a great question. What do you think, Ralph? I think that he did not have feelings for her, but he was aware of her feelings for him because I don't think she made any secret of it. Yes, I definitely think she didn't make a secret. I definitely think he was aware. So, so, So he was aware, but he just had not responded. And that was because he was not feeling it. He was not able to respond. It was that mixed feeling of, of, of a relationship where somebody loves you, but you like them. You recognize an affection for them, but you don't love them. I think, too, that we certainly know by this point in the series that Spock is part Vulcan, part human. Yes. And we also know that he has made a choice to be logical and live, live, live through his Vulcan heritage. But that doesn't mean that he doesn't have the feelings. I, you know, It's hard to say if his awkward reaction to Layla now – was because he simply knew how she felt about him. But I think as we soon discover that he actually did have feelings and he just chose not to express them because it would have been uh, in deference to his Vulcan logical way of life. I think, first of all, this is such a sign of why Spock is such a great character that we could be sitting here looking at this show that's 55 years old (laughs) and speaking to the man who directed the show and still be trying to figure out and not necessarily knowing or being able to agree on what actually is going on. My feeling is between the two of you, which is, and I think it's not that he doesn't love her. It's that he can't love her. Right. He was not capable. And he says that later in that scene that we'll get to. Well, and what I think about, too, is the line that was so painful to me watching it this time in Naked Time where he turns to spot, to Kirk and says, when I feel friendship for you, I am ashamed. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And that he couldn't tell his mother that he loved her. That pain is connected to this moment of walking out on Layla without speaking. Absolutely agree. Excellent point. Very excellent point. I agree. I agree. Our philosophy is a simple one, that men should return to a less complicated life. 
We have few mechanical things here. No vehicles, no weapons. We have harmony here. Complete peace. And this is, I think, as you said, Scott, this is this metaphor for the 60s, for the hippie generation, for the commune. Because that's what the commune is, the idea of we're going to return to a simple, harmonious way of life. Absolutely. And you have the hippies who turned on, they tuned in, they dropped out. And they, you have these uh, plantations of, of hippies, you know, living off the grid, so to speak, back in the 60s. And that, you know, I never, I never got, it took many, many years for me to, for me to realize that this episode is in fact a metaphor for that, that movement. All of the, the, uh, this, the conversation about this connecting to the drug, that never entered into my planning. That's what I was going to ask you. I was curious about that. You can't film a metaphor. You you have to film the reality of what the story is. And then if it turns out to be, to have more meaning, that's fine. But the actors can't do it. The director can't do it. You just can't play four different things at the same time. You have to make your choice. I just want to highlight what you just said because it's so great. And the, the statement, you can't film a metaphor. That is such an important idea. I'd never quite thought of it that way. Of course, you're absolutely right. The actor has to have their choice. Yeah. I mean, they have to be in the scene doing what they, they can't. Be, we can't be worrying about the interpretation can happen later. That's great. That's a great, great point. And, and I think also you have an episode like This Side of Paradise, which was just a successful, a triumphant allegory for the counterculture. And then you have a third season episode like The Way to Eden, which was an unsuccessful uh, attempt at a metaphor for the counterculture. Uh, this Side of Paradise is a beautiful episode. It works. The Way to Eden doesn't. <laughs> There's a the thing of like, if you have to get my philosophical point to enjoy my show, it's not a good show. Yeah, exactly. You know? mm -hmm. And we're outside with Lieutenant Kellowitz and Sulu, and their job is to look around to figure out anything that's out of place. And Sulu is sitting on a rail, and we get our very, very first glimpse of one of these flowers. And I love the way you place it in the frame, because you place it in the foreground, and you have that line of... When it comes to farms, I wouldn't know what looked right or wrong if it were two feet from me. And it's two feet in front of him. <laughs> beautifully, beautifully set up shot. But let me tell you what I missed in that shot. Oh. Because there's the establishing shot. I think I was on a crane as they're walking in. And then I cut to Sulu as he sits on the rail with the plant in the foreground. And if you look very closely, just before we cut away to the other red shirt opening the door, the plant starts to move. Mm. Mm. And my thing was that I wanted to see that plant move and then Sula would leave before it got to him. And I had not anticipated that there would be a cutaway. I hadn't, I didn't start to move soon enough. And I'm curious. So were you uh, involved in the editing at all? Oh, oh, always. The editor would put together the cut and then I would go in and go through the film. And most of the time, those ed editors were wonderful. They just were wonderful at what they did. But we would make changes. But it was not like if on a feature where they hold off and they don't even start to edit till the end so the director could come in and, you know, oversee every cut. Right. Again, it's a collaboration. It's the same kind of collaboration with the editor that I have with the photographer. You've known the Volcanian. On Earth. Six years ago. Did you love him? If I did, it was important only to myself. I find that to be a very interesting line. How did he feel? Mr. Spock's feelings were never expressed to me. That's what uh, you were just talking about. The feelings were never expressed because because they, they, they couldn't be. And now Sandoval asked the key question. Would you like him to stay with us now? To be as one of us? There is no choice, Elias. He will stay. You know, I'll tell you what occurred to me at this point, and I'm curious, Ralph, what you think, is the, everything in the setup, this is almost like a horror film. Yes, the net is closing right. around Spock. We're with McCoy, who's doing uh, medical exams, and what we find out is that when he tells Kirk that everybody is in perfect condition, not a single problem. If there are many more of them, I could throw away my shingle. Kirk here. Spock here, Captain. There seems to be a total absence of life on the planet, with the exception of the colonists themselves and various types of flora. One other thing we find out is that they came with animals. 
some of so something must have happened to them. Mm -hmm. And I love the moment too, because we're still with McCoy and McCoy asks, I would like to see their medical records. And I love uh, Kirk mm -hmm. just going, yes, I thought you'd like yeah, that. So I I thought you yeah. might. <laughs> Sandoval is showing Kirk the soil and that this is just the perfect climate to grow things. We have a moderate climate, moderate rains all year round. It gives us all we need. What those scenes are, they're exposition. Right. And that's what you try to do with exposition so it doesn't look like exposition. But in that scene with Kirk and Sandoval, right behind them is that white fence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And on the other side of the fence is a garden, which is the garden that I would have had to shoot if Jill had been able to come out to the Disney ranch. But, oh, but it's because right. she couldn't, and then when you compare what I would have gotten there with the scene as I was able to shoot it in Bronson Canyon, and again I say, the measles were a gift. Yeah. Wow. Wow. That's that's a great point. That's a great point. I heard Sandoval saying they could grow anything here. That's true, sir. They've got a variety of crops in: grains, potatoes, beans. Make your point. Well, sir, for an agricultural colony, they actually have very little acreage planted. There's enough to sustain the colony, but very little more. And to me, that's like, well, why should there be more? Yes. There's no right. reason for them They have what they need. Little... They have no they wants, they no need. needs. And that's yeah. delivered yeah. by Lieutenant DeSalle, played by Michael Barrier, who's back with the crew of the Enterprise after first being seen in Squire of Gothos. And we will see him again in the second season's Cat's Paw. The mystery continues because having examined Sandoval and examined Sandoval's medical records, when he was a kid, there was scar tissue on his lungs, there was an appendectomy, and now his lungs are perfect, and even his appendix has grown back. Spock and Layla in the field. In the garden. In the garden, right. Oh, so this is, and this is where they would have had to film. So you, did you film this later on, well, I guess? I think it was the fifth day where we went to Bronson Canyon, and he's seen that was on a location with that had Jill in it, that was at Bronson Canyon. And he's seen that didn't have Jill in it was shot at the ranch. Spock is trying to find out what's going on. How did you survive? And she keeps avoiding the question. And we have the slightly sexist line. I've never understood the female capacity to avoid a direct answer to any question. Slightly sexist. <laughs> and I never understood you until now. She put his, her hand on his heart. And it's so interesting because I compare this again to Naked Time and Chapel and some of the things she says about Spock, some of her insights. There was always a place in here where no one could come. There was only a face you allow people to see. Only one side you'd allow them to know. And I think of Chapel saying, I'm in love with you, Mr. Spock. The human Mr. Spock. The Vulcan Mr. Spock. She's nailed him. I think she's 100% right. Emotions are alien to me. I'm a scientist. Someone else might believe that. Your shipmates, your captain, but not me. So both Chapel and Layla, they're, they're gravitating to the same things that they love about Mr. Spock. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But what Layla has loved about Mr. Spock is about to change. So, that's true. So, oh, that's an interesting point. Yeah, like, like, okay, but well, I'll get to that point in a second. Mr. Sandoval, within the hour, I've received orders from Starfleet Command to evacuate all personnel from this colony. Naturally, you'll inform your people to begin preparations. We will have accommodations for you aboard the Enterprise. No. And he says it calmly, like you pointed calmly. out, yeah, Ralph. He says it right. calmly. That's right. His whole attitude in that scene is so calm, and I just think Frank is brilliant in it. Captain, it's entirely unnecessary. We're in no danger here. The, the way that Kirk is starting to represent authority and Sandoval and his people are starting to represent the defiance. You know, Kirk was under orders to you know, evacuate the colony, just like he was under orders in the previous episode to open diplomatic relations with the planet Amini R7. So this is now two episodes in a row in which Kirk is, he's, he's under orders. He's, it's not just, you know, the Enterprise is out there and they discover a new planet. He, he's under orders and he is starting to experience resistance from Sandoval, who's going to make his job very difficult. Sandoval is resisting, but he's not fighting. It's just 
Right. He's just stating very calmly a position, and Kirk isn't to the place where he's going to really assert. I I love quiet things like that. Yeah, it's a good point. It's very dialed back. Yes. Your own instruments have shown that we're all in perfect health. We've had no deaths here. What about your animals? We're vegetarians. That doesn't answer my question, sir. Why did all your animals die? Captain, you stress very unimportant matters. We will not leave. And by the way, I'm totally Team Sandoval. I don't think this makes any sense at all to me. I think you found something completely different from what you expected. It would make much more sense for me, for the Enterprise, to fi- want to figure out what's going on, not to insist on uh, evacuating the colonists. Well, I want to I want to uh, address that as we get later into our play-by-play, because I do have something to say about that. But, but Ralph, I want to ask you, the, the scene where Spock gets uh, shot by the spores... The way that this scene was shot, Ralph, with Spock and Layla, with Leonard and Jill, is just so beautiful because the camera is a little bit lower and you're looking at Layla and Spock walking towards the plant through the plant. Let me tell you about that one. The first shot is through the plant and you see the two of them back and they're framed within the plant. Then they take take a few steps they come forward and hit their marks, and Leonard he missed his mark. Part of his face is behind the plant. He needed to be back about four inches. And uh, I don't know whether the camera operator, because I always checked with the operator afterward, did you get it? And they will tell me yes or no. And I don't remember whether the operator had not realized it or whether he had and told me, and I... The scene was so well acted, I wasn't going to do it again. Uh Yeah, it's beautiful. It's just for an instant. And then Leonard comes forward even more, and then it's just him and the plant. And, and of course, again, the performances of the two of them in that scene is just – it's just dynamic. It's so funny because I actually – I've always liked that his face gets obscured in this one. It just seems symbolic to me about what's about to happen. You've not yet explained the nature of this thing. It's basic. Properties and elements are not important. What is important is it gives life, peace, love. Just like the drugs of the 60s. It's like LSD. I was one of the first to find them. The spores. And then we see the first time that one of the plants fires its spores. Spores? And the reaction of Leonard to the shot and seeing Spock with the big blue sky right behind him. And then you hear the music, the music motif composed by Alexander Courage, originally for the cave, is now being being used to describe falling under the spell, the drug effect of the spores. And initially, the reaction that Spock has is painful. It's painful because only half of him can accept it, and the other half, his Vulcan half, is resisting. No. No. It shouldn't hurt. No, I can't. Please don't. Not like this. It didn't hurt us. I am not like you. I think the moment is so great, and it's, and Nimoy plays it absolutely beautifully. The way he handles the pain, as you see him coming out of the pain and his face relaxes and we hear Ruth's theme again and he looks at her and Layla smiles touches his face and says now now you belong to all of us and we to you there's no need to hide your inner face any longer we understand and his reaction (laughs) once he, he gives in and he says two things he says I love you and then he says, I can love you. Which are two different things. Yes. And both of them are said with such beauty, with such conviction. There's almost something heartbreaking to that line, I can love you. Because all this point, he couldn't. To begin with, I can love you, that goes back to something we discussed about his being able to love her six years before. Scott, I see, I don't think it's a matter of giving in. I think it's an awakening and a discovery. 
Absolutely. That's a great point. It, it is a discovery because- It's a discovery. His, his reaction here is so fundamentally different from his reaction to the disease that he gets from Chapel in The Naked Time. Yeah. The effect of the disease in The Naked Time, it's, it's described like alcohol, and alcohol is a depressant. And the effect of, of Spock showing his emotions in The Naked Time is he breaks down in tears because he couldn't love his mother. Whereas now, the effect of the drug, the LSD, so to speak, in The Side of Paradise is like, like he even describes what you're describing in the vernacular is a happy pill. Yes. And his reaction to the emotion is so much different. He's embracing it like never before or never again, I don't think we will see Spock embrace emotion with so much, like you point out, Ralph, discovery okay. and, and happiness as he does in this episode. Uh, how was filming Leonard during that scene? And, and do you remember if that was a scene that took a couple of takes? I don't think so. I, I think that uh, I'm sure that almost all of those were probably on one take. And let me tell you, this is the pers a personal thing about that scene. That was, according to my remembrance, that was about our fifth day of filming. Mm -hmm. It was after that scene that Jerry Fitterman told me, he said that after we did that scene, that's what I knew. I wanted to work with you some more. Oh, wow. That is amazing. That is That's amazing. Great. That's great. So I'm going to say something a little personal, which I've been debating whether or not I would bring up. But one of the differences between me watching this episode today and me watching as a kid is I have had some of these experiences. I have taken some of these happy pills and <laughs> I had a truly, truly profound and transformative experience. I mean, as we said on the show before, I am kind of Spock-like. I tend to be sort of reserved emotionally. I not don't come from a demonstrative family. And I was with friends on uh, MDMA, and I had this feeling. And it, it was so, because it gives you a sense of safety and connection, and I felt these barriers come down. And the biggest feeling that I had was that, oh, I'm insecure and nervous and worried about what people think of me and everyone else is too. And this thing that is separating us is actually one of the things that makes us most similar that we all have in common. What I learned and when and why people have had profound experiences on some of these drugs is it's when you can take something from that world back to our world. That experience made me a more open person, a more sensitive person. It made me a better writer. It made me kinder. It, it really, and I, it was so big to feel those doors kind of open up. And so now watching this, I think about what that transition from Spock, who's got to always walk around tense, to suddenly just go, oh, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay to be who I am and to love who I want to love. Wow. That's amazing. That is amazing. That is amazing. Uh, so a couple things that in the earlier versions of the screenplay, Ralph, I'm wondering if at any point during the development process or during the pre-production process, did you know that Sulu was initially yeah. the one who was supposed to fall in love in this episode, not Spock? I knew that. And it was Dorothy who changed it. That's right. And it also involved McCoy discovering a condition that would have made it necessary for Sulu to leave Starfleet had the spores not mm. cured his condition because the spores bring people back to health. The other thing about the earlier versions of this, uh, of this story was that the spores were a communal intelligence, Steve, not unlike being of the body in mm. The Return of the Archons. And in addition to restoring health, the spores could also bring the dead back to life. Very interesting, oh. very interesting from the earlier versions. I wonder if that's why where Sulu's line came from. Oh, Are maybe? you sure they're not dead? I wonder if that's a, a remnant of a previous version of the script. Could have been. My orders are to remove all the colonists. And that's exactly what I intend to do with or without your help. Without, I should think. Again, very calm, very calm. Yeah, and, I yeah. think and then walks away. Would you like to use a butterfly net on him, Jim? No, I'll think I'll use a... Uh, I guess my question is, 
do you understand Sandoval's point of view? Does his position make sense? Yes. I mean, yeah. it's, it's his way of life. It's paradise. It's, it's a life with, without any conflicts. We're in good health. It's paradise. Where's Mr. Spock and Mr. Sound? We haven't seen them since we began our check. We try to call him on the communicator. Spock. No answer. And now we are with Spock and Layla, yes. and they are looking at clouds. So a couple things to say about this moment. So Spock could not be happier, and neither could Layla. But if we notice, of course we notice, that Spock has changed his uniform to match the uniform that the rest of the colonists are wearing. So here's my question to both of you. What happened between the moment that Spock was wearing his blue Starfleet uniform and to where he is now wearing the colonists' uniform. And Steve, I sense you are starting to smile. Where I am going with this is that was there a scene that we didn't see where Spock, who has now said, I love you and I can love you and I now will love you, where Layla and Spock had sex? I can't think of any reason why they didn't. I can't either. That's my feeling. Ralph? Well, I have to tell you something. 55 years later, I didn't know he changed his uniform. (laughs) (laughs) Surprise. (laughs) Surprise. I have made, and as many times as I've looked at it, I'm always impressed with that scene because it's just a more beautiful scene than if I'd had to shoot it at the ranch. Absolutely. Well, and I love this line because I think this sums up so much about Spock. He says, as they're talking about clouds and rainbows, he says, You know, I can tell you exactly why one appears in the sky, but considering its beauty has always been out of the question. Spock is finally just stopping to smell the roses. Discovering. Discovering. I I don't know if, I'm not expecting necessarily an answer to this, but I wonder if any of the writers had done LSD because so many of these things that they're saying is what people say, you know, like I never, I never looked at a leaf before. I never really saw it. That's like, that is so much the experience. I don't know. I wouldn't know. And what what difference does it make? (laughs) Right. That's a good point. (laughs) Here's a couple interesting points I would like to make here. So first of all, you know, we have now seen Sp- Spock as a changed person. The exterior of Spock has completely changed because he is embracing his human side and he is now suppressing his Vulcan side. He's like, I don't care about that side anymore. I do love, I can love, I can look at the clouds. I can talk about the dragon on Berengaria 7. So Spock is so changed, but is he still the Spock that Layla fell in love with? That is such an interesting question. It never, ever occurred to me. It's the Spock that she wanted him to be when she was in love with him. Possibly. Yes. That's a good point. She's now seeing the Spock that that she wanted to see before, but maybe after hanging out with this guy for a little bit, she's going to be, no, I think I liked it better when you were logical. I mean, you know. (laughs) Except she's the one that is responsible. She's the one who took him from the garden held out her hand to him. He wouldn't take it, so they walked off. She she was the one who led him to the spore. She got him into the position to have the spore shoot at him. She did it. It's so interesting to me because there's, there's so many um, Adam and Eve kind of stories in Star Trek, and all, going all the way back to the cage. And what's interesting to me about this one, and obviously this side of paradise, that's one of the things we're talking about, is in this Adam and Eve story, Eve brings knowledge, brings Adam to the tree of knowledge to go into the Garden of Eden (laughs) rather than having the bite of the tree of knowledge take you out. Yeah. You know, Kirk Kirk is going to take him out. Kirk is the serpent. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. The, the other, the other point though, is that, and Steve, we discussed this and we proposed this question back when we did our deep dive on shore leave, that it was, it was a missed opportunity because Spock was on the Enterprise for half of that episode, that we never got to see Spock's fantasy on the amusement park planet in Shore Leave. And I remember when I posted that question to our Facebook page, Enterprise Incidents, Ralph, it was you who pointed out that we will get to see Spock's fantasy because we are now seeing Spock's fantasy play out in, in real life on Omicron SETI 3 with Layla, because this 
would have been his fantasy, and it's actually happening. One thing I think is an important thing to discuss also, because we just did Return of the Archons, and in Return of the Archons, there are also these people walking around saying it's paradise, everything is perfect, it's bliss. And in that one, we went, that's not true. They're being controlled. They're basically slaves. It's not, you know, we, we don't know exactly what was going on inside of them, but it wasn't paradise. The question is, what is this? Is this what they say it is? How is this really these people feeling these things? Is it really them? Like you ask, is this the Spock that Layla had fallen in love with? Well, is this really them? Or is this somehow being controlled or their personalities um, taken by the spores? I'm not sure that I go that deep. Well, let me say this. If a series has a group of people and you are doing it with a continued storyline, that's one thing. These are Literally, each of each episode is an individual story. It's, right. it's great that you're linking them together, but I think that sometimes uh, when I would go to do a series, I never till I got to something like Dynasty, and I didn't stay to I didn't stay very long. But like on the Waltons, or on so many of the shows, I just always thought they were little movies, individual right. movies with the beginning and an end and and a separate entity. That's the way I looked at all of the stuff that I did. One of the joys about about this podcast is that we have taken a, a sort oh. of big picture look at it, and it's opened – I certainly – it's opened our eyes uh, oh. to, to a completely new way of looking at the series. And to answer Steve's question, uh, do you side with Sandoval? I think, Steve, you just answer your own question with your question because if you are doubting whether or not – the spores have altered the the colonists and soon the Enterprise crew in such a way that it's not really them. Then I think Sandoval is wrong, and I think Kirk was it will be right to be the serpent and take them out of paradise. And I was going to save my argument for that moment, but th- I think that Kirk did the right thing because unlike an episode like The Apple, where the people are healthy and happy, but they're being overseen by a machine. Yeah. They're still free to get up in the morning and do whatever they want. They're not altered. They're just stuck in arrested development. In the case of this side of paradise, you have a situation where the colonists and the enterprise crew are altered by the spores. Now, while they're happy under the influence of the spores, they are under the influence of something that is altering their train of thought. And if they are not operating and, and, and living life under their own free will, then that is not living a real life. And that is why it was right for them to get rid of the spores and get off the planet. The spores were not they, – they may have had some fringe benefits in terms of like, you know, you know giving people – you know, back an appendix or, you know, a kidney that they might have donated. Uh, but the other thing is that the planet is being bombarded by these birthal rays, which without the effect of the spores will kill people. So let's say the Enterprise gets out of there and leaves the colonists alone on Omicron City 3 and someone has an adrenaline rush that makes them get rid of the spores. Well, they're going to have to get reinfected by the spores again, or they're going to die by the Berthold rays. Another reason why Kirk was right to be the serpent and take the colonists out of this so-called paradise. Yeah, and Kirk, that's exactly what Kirk says in the very, very final scene. But as the Enterprise pulls away and you see, and I love that shot of pulling away and seeing the planet, that's, that's what Kirk says in that scene. Yep. Mm-hmm. In fewer words. Yes. <laughs> uh, I, it's funny. I actually think your argument, Scott, is 100% correct. If they are not them, then Kirk is right. I think they are them. I think they are a version of them. That's the, that's the difference, I think. You think, say that again? If they're really being controlled by the spores, and this isn't really them, then Kirk is right. They are, they are at some level being controlled. They need to be taken off the planet. What I what I will say, and, and I won't go into the whole thing. We can save it till we get to the end of the show. But is that 
we are constantly, humans are constantly affected by environment and chemicals and things that change our personalities. And this goes, I mean, it's like so much of a bigger conversation that we can't get into, but there's all sorts of arguments about whether or not humans have free will at all and how the, in terms of how the brain works, that they're decisions that are being made in the brain before we actually make the decisions consciously or that, um, and how much of our chemistry in terms of dopamine, dopamine and serotonin, serotonin and cortisol affect our decision making process and how much of those like you think of people that are on antidepressants or things like that. We're constantly our personalities are actually in flux based on chemicals we're interacting with. So the idea of there is an us a free will is actually maybe more complicated than we would like to believe. Anyway, yeah, this is a much, much bigger conversation. Yeah. One thing I would put in, I'm not sure that I would use the word controlled by the spores. It's a choice. The spores have happened to them and they're happy with it and they're content to stay there, to, to, yeah. to stay under the influence, but they're not compo controlled by it. That's what I think. I agree with you. But if they're not controlled by it, just to play devil's advocate, when they get off of it, wouldn't they make the choice to get back on it? Like, don't you think at least some of the colonists would be like, well, that's no, 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 I, I want to, I want to stay here and you know go back to a plant, get shot by the spores, and be like, you know, peace out. Well, that's what I was going to bring that up at the end of the show, but yeah. but this is one of the big questions. Let let's save it. Let's talk about it when we get to the okay. end. Yes, great. Yeah. But I think that is a that is a key question. What we haven't said is that while uh, Spock and Layla are having their romantic moment, the communicator has continued to beep. And finally, Layla grabs it and opens it. And we hear Kirk yell, Spock! <laughs> and I love every single thing Nimoy does <laughs> from this point forward in the show. Not that I didn't like what he's doing before. Even the way he says, yes, what did you want? And the reaction that Kirk has to this person on the other line, his best friend, completely not behaving correctly is awesome. Well, not only that he's not behaving correctly, but the surprise because it's Spock. I mean, it's yeah. so different from Spock's behavior because Sp Spock is not rigid. He just, that's who he is. And go back to something we spoke about before. The conflict, and I, and I don't like the word conflict, between the human side and the Vulcan side, but the fact that he is a Vulcan and he's in the military. Yeah, it is kind of right. a military, sure. And when you're in the military, you don't say, well, I don't want to do this way because yeah. Spock has moved into the military. I think his father was military. His father was an ambassador. Correct. <laughs> That's but, right. <laughs> but but it's, it's just who he is. But you know what? The other thing, Ralph, is this. Throughout this episode, and we're only in the middle of Act 2. I know. That, yeah, yeah, we're only in the middle of Act <laughs> 2. <laughs> the but uh, this, you know, we knew this was going to be a deep dive. But but so, you know, we've established, you know, a tone of drama. The scenes between Spock and Layla are so sensitive. And mm. now you have humor. So you have this seamless shift in tones that really do make this episode feel like a mini movie. Good. Thank you. <laughs> this stuff is so much fun. Uh, all of it. Uh, Spock, I don't know what you think you're doing, but this is an order. Report back to me at the settlement in 10 minutes. We're evacuating all colonists to Starbase 27. No, I don't think so. You don't think so what? I don't think so, sir. <laughs> <laughs> and... Kirk orders him to report to him immediately, and we drop the communicator. That didn't sound at all like Spock, Jim. I thought you said you might like him if he mellowed a little. I didn't say that. You said that. I Not exactly. <laughs> so they use the dropped communicator to act as a homing beacon right. so that Kirk can go uh, look for him. And, and this is a moment that is one of the finest moments, not just of the episode, but of the series itself. Spock hanging from the tree. Ralph, how did this come together? Well, as it was scripted, and as I had planned it, the five of them, Kirk, Sulu, another red shirt, Spock, and, Le and, and, and Jill, are, were standing in the middle of the field. And we were, we were lit. And they were saying the lines just as they were written, and it wasn't working. There was no way that you could say those lines just standing face to face, the scene would have gotten ugly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I 
just out of the side glance of my eye, 50 yards away, I saw that tree with the limb. And I asked Jerry, I said, and we were lit, ready. All, all I had to do was say was, okay, let's shoot it. And I said, Jerry, I don't want to shoot it here. Can we move it? And he said, sure. So we went over and Leonard didn't say, I mean, imagine, now, I didn't know anything about Leonard. And now I'm asking Leonard, now does he playing a love story, which is, you know, hang from the, from the limb like a monkey. Never a word. And the point is that when Kirk comes over, Leonard could now say the same lines just calmly. And Kirk's reaction is not to the line. It's to the, I've been seeing him hanging there. That's adding to it. He didn't have to be sassy. Just the look, it did it. And Leonard was brilliant. You were told to report to me at once. I didn't want to, Jim. That smile and just the joyfulness. And Bill did the same thing. I mean, Bill just played the tree. And it's, it's, it's an iconic scene, I think. Absolutely, it is. There's so many shots that you did that I don't think anyone up to this point in Star Trek has used the camera to tell the story the way that you did. And this is such a perfect example of like, yeah, if we just had them standing and Spock said, I don't, you know, was refusing to do things and smiling, we all would have gotten it. But that shot of him hanging from the tree tells us everything is so much more powerful than any of the dialogue. And you did so many shots like that. And it's comedy. And it's comedy. Absolutely. I'm also curious, by the way, you used a zoom lens on that shot. Did you use a lot of zooms at that point in the 60s? Oh, yes. At that point, you, well, I guess you could do, you, know, you could do a zoom with the, with the Mitchell, but usually we did your zooms with the, the smaller camera, but the one that mm-hmm. you, you couldn't, couldn't use that camera with dialogue because it made so much noise. Right. I love to when Kirk walks up on them, that he is not only looking at Spock and just completely shocked by what's happening there, but he's looking over to Layla because on some level, she has to be responsible for this. Oh, absolutely. Miss Colomi, you'll have to come back with us to the settlement and prepare to transport up to the ship. And Spock, you know, comes down from the tree and says, there'll be no evacuation, Jim, but... Perhaps we should go back and get you straightened out. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and for the second time, we place Mr. Spock under arrest. Mr. Sulu, Mr. Spock is under arrest and he's in your custody until we get back to the Enterprise. <laughs> this arrest doesn't work very well. Spock takes Layla's hand and says, Very well. Come with me. And they walk and we hear the music coming because there are plants in the foreground. And of course, we know exactly what's going to happen next. <laughs> But Kirk is walking behind Sulu yeah. and Kelowitz. So when those guys approach the plants and the plants shoot the spores, Kirk is still out of range for the spores to infect him. Well, but beyond that, Kirk is angry. I never, ever thought about oh, that. that. You angry. are right. Of course I'm right. <laughs> I'm always <You> <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm, the, I'm the director. I'm always right. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. He was angry. angry. That's angry. why he didn't get affected. Of course. You know what's so funny is I actually was always critical of the episode in this moment because I would look at the shot and go, how did Kirk not get hit? But now that you say that he was angry, it all makes perfect sense. Yeah. And I cannot believe in the decades, <laughs> in the many, many times I've watched the show that I never had that thought. Should have called me 55 years earlier. <laughs> you, didn't, you didn't give me your phone number. I would have. I don't think you were alive yet. No, you, yeah. we're still we're still a year and a half away from yeah, this. Yeah, yeah. yeah and, we were still and, a year and a half away. And uh-huh. let's go back to the first shot as – he drops off of the tree, and as they all exit, and Kirk does that wonderful thing, as he walks under the tree, he looks back up at it. Mm. Just for an instant. I mean, doesn't make a big thing. Just subtle. William Shatner, you know, now, I mean, over the course of his career, especially after he started doing, like, the Priceline commercials, and he started doing Denny Crane, people really got, wow, this guy is really funny. But if you go back to the original series, even before... Uh, like Trouble with Tribbles or I Mud, uh, you know, he had great comic timing. Oh, oh, absolutely. The guy's brilliant. He's an amazing actor. He, he was a classically trained actor, classically trained. And classically trained actors, he said, they can just do everything. Absolutely. Well, so good actors that aren't classically trained still can do everything. It, it's always di- interesting to me, and I'm in no way, in any way, comparing my experiences to yours whatsoever, because it, mine is infinitesimal. But the difference between theater actors and purely film actors 
there, there's frequently a big difference in the way I, they approach I, I may, I, may I disagree? Uh, yes. <laughs> because there are two different mediums. And I have a thing that the group theater in the 30s, mm-hmm. some of the actors, Stella Adler and some of the others, went over to Russia to study with Stanislavski. And then they came back and they formed the group theater. And then eventually that became the actor's studio. Right. But at the same time, when silent films started to talk, and actors, not all of them, but Gary Cooper, James Cagney, Barbara Stanwyck, somehow, I don't know what, how it happened, but I think that the screen actors of the 30s, they were as responsible for method acting as, as the, the New York side, as the actor studio. Same thing. Again, that never occurred to me, but that's so... You, because there's such a naturalism, particularly you talk about like Gary Cooper, he is just being who he is in his performances. Um, yeah, I think that's really interesting. I had the the opportunity, Sandy Meisner, who was in the group mm-hmm. theater and then later was the leading teacher at the Neighborhood Playhouse. And two summers, he came out to California and had a six-week course. And I was able to, to go to it as an observer. It only cost me a hundred bucks. But it was wow. it was an education. And Sandy, of course, his whole thing is that the actor is playing himself that changes the imaginary circumstances. It's so funny because I had classes with people who had classes with Sandy oh, Meister, yeah. you know. And particularly I think about with Meisner, I just think about listening, just learning how to really listen to who you are acting with. Mr. Sulu understands, don't you, Mr. Sulu? Of course we can't remove the colony. It'd be wrong. And Kirk's reply, I don't know what these plants are or how they work, but you're all going back to the settlement with me and those colonists are going aboard the ship. It's so interesting the way Kirk gets isolated in this episode, because the next person we see is McCoy, who's beaming plants up to the Enterprise. And now we hear for the first time, very Southern (laughs) McCoy. Hiya, Jimmy boy. Hey, I've taken care of everything. Now, all y'all got to do is just relax. Doctor's orders. I love his um, take. I love what DeForest Kelly did. Like his southern, his southern charm just came out. Was that a directorial choice or was that no, an actor no, he, choice? He played it. The, the only thing I did is I gave him the wide, the wide shot, far away from the camera, just strolling along. You no, know, he just that, he just did it. Wow. And that's what I would do. I would stage it, and then if what they were doing was not what was going to work, then I would say something. But actors come to the set prepare. Good actors come to the set. They come ready and wanting to act. And all you have to do is just give them the, the room and let them let them know they have the freedom. He just did it. And I mean, I just applaud. Yeah, he's great. He's amazing. It's so fun. And I love Kirk coming up asking, how many of those did you beam up? Oh, must be, might not own a hundred by now. <laughs> <laughs> hey doc, I'm ready to energize. Everything okay with those plants? This is the captain. Beam me up. Well, sure, if you want. He goes up to the Enterprise and is on the bridge and tells Ahura to put him through to Starfleet. And her reply? Oh, I'm sorry, Captain. I can't do that. Shell Nichols is fantastic in this moment. She's wonderful. I worked with her once later. She she and George, uh, I was able to work with once at, after I left Star Trek. And I, when I worked with her, I think it was a group in a bar scene. And she was playing a prostitute. Oh, wow. Wow. Who sang, which she did. Uh-huh. She, yeah, great voice. And she has not only will she not put him through to Starfleet, but she short circuited all of the uh, mm-hmm. equipment. Except for ship to surface, we'll need that for a while. Which is our first sign that, oh, we're not evacuating the colonists. <laughs> we're not going anywhere. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 Right. <laughs> and Kirk finds one of the plants on the bridge. It doesn't shoot him with spores and he tosses it. And I love that you had the camera follow it to the ground, that we stick with the plant. I think that was a great choice. And it's like, uh, it's like remember where this pod plant landed. And by the way, talking about these pod plants, I can't help but think of invasion of the body snatchers mm-hmm. with mm-hmm. The, the pods and shooting, you know, shooting the spores and and the way that the you know the colonists and now the people in the enterprise are becoming co- part of this collective community. Yes. You know, even though they're not quite one, but was invasion of the body snatchers something else that was you were conscious of when you were shooting this? But here they're happy. I mean, this is a happy show. 
Yes. Until it, until, until it starts getting teary eyed. <laughs> I love the scene in the corridor with the crew lined up. Yes. Uh, what is this uh, character's name? Eddie okay, Paskey. This is Eddie Paskey, who is uh, Bill Standin. And he was also Lieutenant Leslie. Yeah. Uh, he and he had a rare speaking line in this scene. Get back to your stations. I'm sorry, sir. We're all transporting down to join the car. I said, get back to your station. No, oh, sir. This is mutiny, Mister. And Leslie looks at him and smiles and says, "Yes, sir. It is." He's very good in it. I've read that he was in 39 episodes of Star Trek. That's right. Leslie, I mean, most of the time he didn't have a line. Right. But right. he did a couple of times sit in the captain's chair when when they beam up from uh, Gothos and they're all taking their places on the bridge. When Kirk, when Kirk enters the bridge, Leslie is actually sitting in the captain's chair. And then in Obsession- Yes, I killed him. You killed in an obsession. <laughs> <laughs> but then he came back to life in the next I, episode. I, I, I know, I know, I know. And that is the end of Act Two. In Act Three, we hear Kirk in his log, and he sounds really, really sad. My crew is deserting to join the Omicron colony, and I can't stop them. And we see crew just lining up and beaming down. And McCoy, in a beautiful wide shot under a tree, <laughs> we hear his sort of response. I'm not interested in any physical, psychological aspects, Jim boy. <laughs> we all perfectly healthy down here. I've heard that word a lot lately, perfect. Everything's perfect. Kirk is not a fan of perfect. He's also not a fan of paradise. <laughs> no. And Kirk is trying to get McCoy to do what he did in The Naked Time. What he's done over and over again is cure this thing. And McCoy's response is, Who wants to counteract paradise, Jim boy? We have tea being poured. Spock and Sandoval, and they're talking about that almost the entire crew has beamed down. And then Kirk enters, and you tilt up towards him standing over them at the table. Where's McCoy? He went off to create something called a mint julep. Which makes me go, wait, so they got bourbon at the colony? <laughs> That's nice. This is an example of the exposition that you were talking about That's before, right. Ralph, because we're hearing all about where the pod plants and the spores originated from, how they how they travel through space. Uh, and there's a great blooper where Leonard Nimoy says the word suppository instead of <laughs> repository um, until they find a host. And this is what made me think of Evasion of the Body Snatchers. Sure. But it is a true Eden as they describe it, but it is not artificial, which is why I'm still not completely on board with uh, taking side of all side in all of this. Yeah, but, but also that scene is really not exposition. It's Sandoval and Spock trying to convert, convince Kirk to join them. What I would say is it's good exposition. We're finding out information, but but our actors aren't just explaining stuff to the audience. They are, they have a motivation. The words have a goal. There's a conflict within oh, the scene. Uh, always. Yeah. Always. Yeah. And then even if, if it's kind of vague, you try to find the, yep. the, the conflict that every scene has somebody with an objective and somebody who is resisting the objective. And in this case, it's Sandoval and Spock with the objective and Kirk resisting. So he says, I'm going back to the Enterprise. He's yes. going back to the ship. Yes. And... This next scene, My favorite. I think, is one of absolutely, Raph, this next scene is one of the very finest scenes in Star Trek history. Kirk enters the bridge. It is deserted. And there is the pan across the, the consoles until you get back to Kirk standing in front of the doorway to the turbo lift. And he calls down. To engineering, he calls for Scotty. It would have been interesting actually to have Scotty in the episode to show him uh, in defiance of Kirk. But you know, at least we hear about him and that he's there. But William Shatner's performance in this scene is absolutely one of his finest hours. And and Ralph, I would love to hear how you sort of prepped Bill Shatner for this scene, how he shot it, how you shot it, how many takes you did. But it's more than one setup. Yeah. Okay. I, but I, the scene I, I, where his I, I, monologue. I can I can lead you through a wide shot to see him come in, and then I needed a moment. I I don't know why I did it, but I loved. I, I'm proud of that move of rotating stuff into a close up of Kirk. 
just for a second, and then back to the wide shot as he comes down and stands by his by his chair and starts calling. Engineering, Scotty. Biochemistry lab. Security. Is there anyone on board? This is the captain. And there's nobody there, and he sits in the chair, and that's when he starts to talk. Mutiny. Ship can be maintained in orbit for several months, but even with automatic controls, I cannot pilot her alone. By that time, I've gone from the wide shot to the closer shot that pushed into a close-up. In effect, I am marooned here. Then back to the wide shot, where he moves over to the console. And then once he sits down there, then I got closer as he's talking about the impossibility of what's happening. I'm beginning to realize just how big this ship really is. How oh, quiet. I don't know how to get my crew back, how to counteract the effect of the spores. I don't know what I can offer against paradise. I think this is, we've seen Kirk under tremendous pressure. We've seen Kirk where the odds are totally against him. We've seen Kirk facing imminent death. I don't think we've ever seen him so defeated as we see him in this moment. Excellent. You're right. Absolutely. <laughs> and I think one of the things about that, that observation, Steve, is that he's defeated because he's realizing something he probably never realized since he has been the captain of the Enterprise. That it's not that he loves the Enterprise. He loves the crew of the Enterprise. He loves the, the being the captain of of this crew, of having 428 people. Like he may have felt the burden of that in episodes like Balance of Terror. But you're now now he's realizing just how much he needs his crew to sustain him. And even though I do think that Kirk was right to counteract the spores, I do feel like his he is being partly motivated because he does want his crew back whole I think so, too. so he can be who he likes to be. I think Paradise is Spock's love story. I also think it's Kirk's love story. I think that's a great point. I think that's exactly true. The whole point is that in other episodes that I, as I've been watching, he has literally said he loves the Enterprise. Yeah. I think that this probably is the strongest, strongest statement in the series to show that. And you know what, Scott? I would I would put it just slightly differently than the way you said it, which is that I think it's that he loves the Enterprise and without the crew, the Enterprise isn't the ship that he loves. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Oh, oh, oh yeah, yeah, but 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 to him, the Enterprise is the the ship and the crew. Yes. I mean it's 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 one entity. Yeah. Right. Uh, no, I agree. I agree with both your points. And, and it's it's the Enterprise and its crew. I mean, it's it's the whole picture. When he's saying how I never realized how big this ship was, yes. how quiet. Like he's brilliant. He is wonderful as an actor. He's so wonderful I, I, in this I, I, moment. Absolutely. And subdued, which Bill wasn't always. Now I must tell you, after the spore shoots him, and there's a camera moved in, and Jerry told me this. If you look again, his face was in was not really lit, but as we went in, the lighting on the, his face increased because Jerry Finnerman believed that in lighting, you're not only lighting for a close-up, but you're also lighting the character's internal feelings. Ralph, I never noticed that until my rewatch to prepare for this episode of Enterprise Incidents. I actually stopped the episode and rewound it a little bit, and I said, wait a minute, like after Kirk gets shot by the spores and the camera zooms in on William Shatner, like am I wrong in noticing that that his face is is lit up a little bit? And I went, man, that Jerry Finnerman is a genius. Yes, he is. It's something we've been talking about from the beginning is how theatrical Star Trek is, that it's not necessarily – trying to be realistic yeah. and the lighting is such a great example of that enterprise to mr spock and i love the way nimoy answers yes jim what is it now <laughs> <laughs> i've joined you i understand now and he's just got to pack some things in his quarters and then he's going to beam down i think shatner's performance of being affected by the spores and having moments where you can feel the inner kirk 
fighting against it are great. Absolutely. After he looks at his his uh, the medal. When he's looking at the medal, you know, he's sitting, he's well lit because he's enlightened by the spores and he's smiling and he's content. And then he looks at the metal and it hits him. And the way he sl- he slams it shut. And from that point on, he's conflicted. And that conflict is where the spores start to lose their power. And that is another reason why I think that Kirk was right to pull the plug on the spores. Yeah. And then we end up in the transporter room. I love the way you shot this. Before we get to yeah. that, because I, I agree with you. <laughs> but uh, he, he goes over and he picks up his bag. Now, somewhere, and I don't remember shooting it, but to pray that there was a shot of him going through the corridor. Do you know if he did or not on the way to the transporter room? No, not that I know but, of. But I know that, there, that they made a, a big cut because as he bends over, the screen is dark enough that they cut right to the transporter room as he's setting the bag down there. I'm sure that I brought him into the Mm. transporter room to do it. I mean, it was not shot that way, but that's great editing. Absolutely it is. And then you see him putting his uh, 20th century suitcase, I have to add, uh, onto the uh, 23rd century transporter platform. (laughs) Close up there and then a wider shot at bringing him up to the console. And then there's a profile shot. And that's the shot, I again, because of Jerry. The lights are out, literally almost in silhouette. And then he turns a light on. And then as he leans into a close-up, and he leans into the light, before he slams his foot and says, No! I can leave! And then the camera moves as he looks to the his bag on the little stage and then turns into that wonderful profile that is so gorgeously lit. I think the combo of where you put the camera, the way uh, Jerry Finnerman lit it and Shatner's performance is just because what you're seeing, it's, um, I remember when we were doing the Godfather, something Coppola said, he said, the job of the director is to make people feel understand what the uh, what the characters are feeling without telling them oh sure and what shatner is doing you could see it in his body you could see the struggle and man when he moves into that shot and turns the light on and it hits his face it's just it is so dramatic and and the moment after where you know that the spores are gone it is just, it's just beautifully done. And I want to say one thing, just because we've been talking about this forever of linking these episodes together. I think if we're saying that there's continuity here, the reason that Kirk can do this is because of the enemy within where he had the strength of will to bring those sides of his, of his together and naked time. Enemy within helped him to beat the disease in naked time. And that experience gave him the strength and the intelligence to beat it to beat the spores here. Absolutely. Excellent point. Absolutely. Excellent point that his devotion, his love for the enterprise as a whole is so strong. And you, you point out the naked time, you know, sort of overcoming the virus, the disease really kind of before McCoy gives him his vaccine. Um, But also in an episode like a land of Troyes, when Kirk is under the spell of the tears of the domain of alas, that by the end of the episode, after McCoy says to Spock, hey, I found a cure. And Spock says to McCoy, sorry, but he beat you to it. The cure for the tears is the Enterprise. And I think the enemy within is part of why Kirk has the philosophy that he has. Because he needs his pain. He needs the dark side. That's what makes him who he is. So this, these spores that are taking all that away... That doesn't make sense. He has figured something really important out about how the universe works. But let me interject this. And what I said before about each being a, a separate movie, but that doesn't affect the characters. I mean, Shatner right. and Nimoy, they are playing the same character, adapting to the different circumstances, the different plots. Right. And now we have the answer. Violent emotions needs anger. That's what's going to kill the spores. Kirk immediately, of course, has a plan. We don't exactly know what the plan is, but he says, To carry out my plan entails considerable risk. Mr. Spock is much stronger than the ordinary human being. Aroused, his great physical strength could kill. 
and that's exposition, but look at the close-up in the performance. I agree with you. I've often loved this scene where Kirk leans into the transporter console, Mm -hmm. and then the camera swings around a little bit, gives him more of a profile when he gives his captain's log. That transition from a full-on to a profile is almost like the transition from when the spores leave his body and he's back to being the Kirk that we know and love. Yeah. And he calls down to Spock and is sort of pretending that he's still, you know, <laughs> one of them and says, hey, I need some help. You want me to beam up a party? No, I think you and I can handle it. And I love, by the way, there's just a hint of the mischievousness in the way he says, why don't you beam up now? <laughs> I know. <laughs> and Spock says his goodbye to Layla and they kiss. And that is the last moment for Spock to have love. That's the last time he's going to see her. You're right. That's the last time he's going to see her in the state that he's in. Yes. So Kirk beams Spock aboard. And then Shatner steps in, smacks the pole into the palm of his hand. All right, you mutinous, disloyal, computerized half-breed. We'll see about you deserting my ship. There's something almost comedic in Bill's playing. And Spock's anger is just brilliant. It just grows. The term half-breed is somewhat applicable, but computerized is inaccurate. My guess is Nimoy and Shatner had a great time playing this. A machine can be computerized, not a man. What makes you think you're a man? You're an overgrown jackrabbit, an elf with a hyperactive thyroid. As you said, Shatner's been comedic, and the Nimoy's beat work is absolutely crystal clear. Shit. I don't understand. Of course you don't understand. You don't have the brains to understand. All you have is printed circuits. Him realizing that Kirk is not actually one of them, him trying to be nice about him, he deciding, hey, I'm out of here, I'm going to beam back down, and then the slow build of anger. Captain, if you'll excuse me. What can you expect from a simpering, devil-eared freak whose father was a computer and his mother an encyclopedia? My mother was a teacher. My father, an ambassador. That was definitely a line written by Dorothy Fontana because... We see that Spock's mother is a teacher and that his father is an ambassador in the second season episode, Journey to Babel, which was also written by Dorothy Fontana. An ambassador from a planet of traitors. He first shrugs off Kirk's insults, but then you can slowly see them get under his skin. And Nimoy's gradual turn to just exploding and throwing Kirk across the room, it's such a great buildup. And another one of many, many great moments just in this very episode, Ralph, that Nimoy plays perfectly. He doesn't have a false moment in it, to the place where he says, please don't, you know, don't go any further. Yeah, yeah, you're yeah. right. He says, please don't. Yeah. Don't say something that you're going to regret. Don't yeah. make me hurt, yeah. hurt you. Don't. Right, right. That please don't means so much. Captain. Please don't. You're a traitor from a race of traitors. And I think one of the key things, and we've seen this with Kirk over and over again, is Kirk will find a weakness. And then, you know, you see it in court martial when he re- he's trying to talk to Finney and says, yes, your daughter is on board and realizes that's the weakness. And I think in this case, it's when he says, and you've got the gall to make love to that girl. That's enough. Yes. That is the weakness. That is the point. He's poking Spock right in literally his heart. (laughs) And the moment that Spock loses it and turns is so great. And he smashes that metal rod (laughs) is just fantastic. I was concerned when we did that because there were some body doubles. Yeah. When you use body doubles, you want to get back far enough. Well, there was no place to get back far enough in there to do it. But I don't think it's too, I mean, I, I think it's get buyable. And this is the thing that we hadn't really gotten so much before of just how much stronger Spock is. We saw him hit Kirk uh, in Naked Time, but now, man, angry Spock is a scary thing. And we end with him literally just about to crush Kirk. The angle looking up at Spock, and that is the end of Act 3. In earlier versions of the outlines, the cure to the spores was either going to be a certain blood type or, get this, the introduction of alcohol into the system. And in one of these earlier versions, Kirk snaps Spock out of 
the spell of the spores by forcing alcohol down his throat. <laughs> it's, <laughs> can you imagine of like a <laughs> drink up, you know, yeah, he's yeah, forcing yeah. like, you know, scotch down his, uh, you yeah. know, that, that would not, not have had the same effect. No, no, no. no. The, the idea is that it's anger. I mean, I think, I think it's brilliant. We're back in Act 4 right where we left off, and there's a long pause. I have, yes. I have a question. Who wrote the line? Had enough? Oh, that's a great question. I know. Who wrote the line? Had enough. That's got to be Dorothy. See, I would think it's a Gene Kuhn line. It could be either, but I mean, it is it, it's so Gene Kuhn. Oh, yeah, you're right. And it is a way of getting out of this situation with just a line. I mean, it's all of a sudden, comedy. I totally understand why Kirk is making jokes. It's correct. And what I love is the contrast between him making these jokes and the slow realization of Spock, mm-hmm. of what's just happened to him. Oh, absolutely. He did that to me deliberately. And the beginning of the heartbreak in this episode, yeah. he says, the Spores, they're gone. I don't belong anymore. And here's what the note I wrote down here. Not even an I'm sorry. Mm, oh. Like, I'm really angry at Kirk in this moment. I understand that he had to do what he had to do. And we could debate whether or not the next set of choices are the right ones. But, man, this guy was in love. He was happy. And you just took that away. And it hurt him. And this is your best friend. And you should have said, dude, I know that was a terrible thing to do. And I'm really sorry, but we have to save the ship. Agree. You know, I, 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 I think he did the right thing, but I think that it was insensitive for him to not be present and aware of the significance of what he did by taking away Spock's sadness. Whether or not he, he, he thought it was the right thing to do, he still should have acknowledged the moment uh, and apologized. I, I agree with that. I, and I'm not sure. I think that when they look at each other, they both knew it didn't have to be said. It was just in their attitude as they talked about the other things. Mm, That's yeah. a good point, too. And, 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 and again, Kirk's line about... Believe me, Mr. Spock, it was painful in more ways than one. That's, that's his way of saying, I'm sorry. There you go. You know what? I think you're totally right. And I also think it's the difference between a 1960s male relationship sensibility and a 2020 sensibility. Mm-hmm. You know, they didn't express their feelings in that way then. And now I look at it and go, dude, say you're sorry. <laughs> um, and then I think the moment that we know that they're back, that Spock is now just back to being Spock, is he says, Captain, striking a fellow officer is a court-martial offense. Well, if we're both in the brig, who's going to build a subsonic transmitter? Wonderful, wonderful. And we're back. Kirk has been logical about this whole process now, but his logic is governed by emotion because what Kirk wants, what he wants for more than one reason, is to have his crew back whole. Yes. You know, I think he certainly is motivated by ego, by the prospect of being the captain of the Enterprise. I think that that sustains him and completes him. But I also do think that he was right to defy the spores because if any sign of aggression, of anger, of adrenaline is going to negate the influence of the spores, what are they going to keep running back over to the plants to get infected again? And at this point, they're taking so many of the plants have been put aboard the enterprise. That's right. So that at this point to stay on, it would be their death watch. Well, I don't know that we can say that. I don't think we know. We don't know how many plants there are. We don't don't, don't know. And we also, you know, in the three years that they've been there, they never had had that adrenaline moment. So it seems like this culture, I think, is stable. Whether or not we think it should exist is a different question uh, to me. We're down uh, with Layla, who is waiting and waiting, and McCoy comes up. And calls up to the Enterprise. I even love the way that DeForest Kelly says, Enterprise? (laughs) (laughs) Enterprise, Spock here. And he's back in his uniform and he's working and everything in his performance says that he's gone. And Layla gets on the communicator. I was worried something might have happened to you. And just watch Nimoy's reaction. Watch how he processes it. Watch the hesitation and the way he says every line. And how he's trying, he's still, he's trying not to hurt her. And it's in very, very few words. You are all right, aren't you? Yes. Yes, I'm, I'm quite well. And the fact that we see Kirk 
appear behind yeah. him so he is witness to what's happening. Are you still at the beam down point? And is the doctor there? Yes, to both questions. Give your communicator back to Dr. McCoy. You won't need it to beam up. It'll take a few moments. Just wait there. Kirk sits down next to him and very, I think, gently says, Miss Colomi is strictly your concern, but should you talk to her while she's still under the influence of the sport? And I love his response. I'll be back shortly, Captain. He basically tells Kirk, mind your own business. I mean, he can't speak about what's going to happen because he knows it's going to be be difficult. And this goes back to the question I asked at the very beginning. How did he feel about her six years ago? We know how he felt about her under the influence of the spores. What is he feeling? Is he going, I no longer love her? Is he going, I still have these feelings of love that I cannot express? Is he going, this is my duty or this is my honor as a Vulcan to not express these emotions? Like there's a lot going yes. on inside yeah. of Mr. Spock at this moment. I think the thing Leonard was playing is that he knows that the ability to love, it's just not there. Now what you have in this episode is an arc. You have an arc to this story. You have an arc to Spock's character in this story. We start off unsure of where her, his feelings are for Layla. But you get to the end of the episode and we know where what his feelings are for Layla because he just spent most of this episode expressing love to her because he could, because he was able to embrace that side of him because of the spores. So now the spores may have been taken away, but his human side is still there. His human side still feels the spores, but he is choosing to embrace his logical Vulcan side. And from the moment that Layla calls up to the Enterprise, and that moment, by the way, she knows that something is wrong. Yeah. She, she, she knows that something is wrong. And Spock is talking to Layla. She can't see him, but we see Spock. And what we see on Spock's face is he feels bad. Oh. He feels remorse over losing the ability to love her. Mm -hmm. And he knows when he beams her aboard, she is going to be heartbroken. Yeah. And if she is heartbroken, that could lead to the loss of the spores. Oh, I hadn't thought about Spock. Well, I mean, I guess he knows it's going to be taken away from, but I hadn't thought about him thinking about that for this moment. Yeah, I, 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 really I, did, I did, didn't think. It. He knows he's not only going to hurt her feelings. Yeah, but, no. But yeah. he, I think he, he's projecting that her feelings being so hurt will cause her to lose the spores, and I think he feels bad about that too. I think that's beyond. I, again, that's overthinking. We have to think in terms of what the actor is playing, and that's really putting a load on him to add that in, just to have to hurt somebody and you know that you're going to be hurting him. And so we're in the transporter room. Spock takes a moment before he beams her up. She materializes, immediately goes to embrace him. And the scene is so painful and her realization. You're no longer with us, are you? You don't see her beam aboard the Enterprise. The camera stays on Leonard Nimoy and mm. on his face. Ralph, why do that? To do it differently. The main thing was to see her rush into his arms and why take the time to materialize her. Come back to the planet with me. You can belong again. And I think this is a key piece of information is that it's not a one-time shot. You could have the spores, lose the spores, get them again. Yeah. And he says, I can't. The way he says, I can't, he says it in like a hushed tone. Mm -hmm. Like it's painful for him to say, I can't. So the question is, does he mean I can't? Or does he mean, I won't? He means, I can't. I think he means, I won't. Well, by saying, I can't, he's also saying, I won't. If he says, I won't, that's a slap in the face to her. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Yeah, you're right. By saying, I can't. That, so that's taking away... Some of the sting. Some of the sting. There's a line that we're going to get to that I think is so powerful and so upsetting. And it kind of relates to that question, I think. On earth, you couldn't give anything of yourself couldn't even put your arms around me. We couldn't have anything together there. We couldn't have anything together anyplace else. But we're happy here. I, I can't lose you now, Mr. Spock, I can't. And his response. I am what I am, Layla. 
If there are self-made purgatories, then we all have to live in them. Mine can be no worse than someone else's. What a beautifully written, beautifully written, powerfully acted scene. I think there's an important line before the one you just said. Okay. Is he says, I have a responsibility to this ship, yes. to that man on the bridge. Yeah. Right. That's right. And then the line about self-made purgatories. That's why he won't. Saying I have a responsibility means I won't. I could, but I won't. Exactly. Exactly my point. And this line, if there are self-made purgatories, then we all have to live in them. I think that is a terribly tragic line. Yes. And I want to say to Spock, no, you don't. You don't. And I think Spock, by Star Trek Four, would tell this Spock that he's wrong. You don't actually have to live in your self-made purgatory. Mm -hmm. Good point. You know. Excellent point. I have lost you, haven't I? Not only you. I've lost all of it. Spores. I've lost them too. So sad. And- she asks a really good question. This is for my good? I, I, I love that line. <laughs> well, Ralph, I want to ask, like, in terms of shooting the performances between Jill Ireland and Leonard Nimoy, because it's it's two it's two cameras. No, 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 it's one camera. So we had to play it both, both ways. I mean Oh, I see. Gotcha. Yeah. Right, right. Even if you had two cameras, most cameramen don't like to shoot in opposite directions at the same time. I used to use two cameras a lot. If I didn't have them that close together, I would do an over shoulder and a close up as long as I'm shooting in the same direction. That's interesting. I didn't want separate close ups. In a scene like this, I don't like two close ups if you want the people to be together. I want to see them together over shoulder or even like an, an extra close over just holding the ear, a tight close up. Yeah. When you have two separate close ups, there is a division. It separates them. It's a separation. Yeah. That's a great, great point, and one I'm going to tell my students from now on. That's a really good one. Do you mind if I say I still love you? It's such a gentle question, too. Do you mind? And I think this last line of the scene is so brilliant, and it's one of those, I don't know if it's Gene Kuhn or Dorothy Fontana, but it's one of these moments that is so out of nowhere and so touching. You never told me if you had another name, Mr. Spock. And you notice how long it took him to answer it? And he touches her face. And I think that is so telling. That is all the regret. Uh, yes. The love that's still inside of him. Oh, he of course, of course. You couldn't pronounce it. And it's also that look on his face, that smile. Yes. A tender smile, like just letting the love that they had, mm -hmm. letting that version of him peek through one last time for her. It is just beautiful, beautiful, heartbreaking moment. It can bring you to tears. And it would not be the first time, Ralph, that I was brought to tears from an episode that you directed. <laughs> I think you know what the other one is. Yes. It's just such a beautiful, beautiful moment. Well, and I think too, there's, and I don't, I'm not saying that this was what the intention was, but there's a lot of cultures where people have a secret name or a special name that only is shared with their immediate family or loved ones. And that there's a power in some cultures of naming things, of having the name. And I think the name that she cannot pronounce is the love that he cannot share. Mm -hmm. Oh, oh, that's, that's what I think. Beautiful. That's beautiful. Mm -hmm. uh, we're back to working and we hear what the plan is and there's we're going to use this subsonic something or other and it's going <laughs> to make everybody <laughs> angry. Uh, and Kirk describes it as, as if someone put itching powder yeah. under their skin and back down on the planet, <laughs> Sulu and DeSal, <laughs> they, they get immediately irrita irritable and go right into a shovel fight. I love, by the way, Ralph, your shot of just the stuntmen just coming in in the midst of a fight. I think that was great. The second shot over by the barn. Yeah, that's yeah. the one. Uh -huh. And then uh, we go to Sandoval and McCoy. I love DeForest Kelly throughout this entire episode, and this is my favorite, because he gets to do a thing that we've never seen him do before. I've been thinking about what sort of work I could assign you to. What do you mean? What sort of work? I'm a doctor. <laughs> Obviously, that's not useful here. He goes, oh, no. <laughs> he gets up. <laughs> and he up. stands up. <laughs> yeah. He's been chewing on a bit of grass, which he tosses, and he says, Would you like to see just how fast I can put you in a hospital? <laughs> 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 and Sandoval argues with him. Better make me a mechanic. Then I can treat little tin gods like you. So they get into it, and mm -hmm. both of them, Lose the spores. Yeah, let's back up because when do they lose the spores? 
When? Because of the depth that you do. All of a sudden, 55 years later, I was giving this a lot of thought the last couple of days. Okay. And the point is that the sound that we had going, the kind of a music, and, and there was a strange sound over the mm-hmm. first two confrontations, and it quit as he came in. Why didn't it, it keep going through this scene? Because it would have screwed up the scene. Ah. Oh, I see. And, and the time has gone on enough I think they've lost the sports but don't know it. Okay, I think that I think for sure I agree with you. I think that McCoy has lost the spores, but he doesn't know it yet because he's being far more aggressive with Sandoval than Sandoval is but, with but, him. But Sandoval all of a sudden is much more he's not really aggressive, but he's more aggressive than we've seen him when he comes in That's and says, true. I'm going to assign you. Right. So you think that that they both lost the spores sooner than they realized it. And and they don't know it, but all all of a sudden they're they're, they're just thinking differently and not realizing why. Uh, That's that's an excellent point. And I defer to you on this. (laughs) Yeah, that's a great point. Absolutely. And then this is one piece of evidence, 100% for why Kirk is right, oh, yes. uh, which is Sandoval looks around after the spores are gone and says, You've done nothing here. And thank you, by the way, for proving my point. One of, one of a few that I was trying to make on why Kirk did the right thing. We've no, done no, nothing I, I, here. Wait a minute. Hang on. No accomplishments. They were there for a few years and everything was status quo. They, they never lost the spores. But now they are losing the spores. And if it's so easy for them to lose the spores and the Berthal rays are going to be a threat to anybody who's there without the spores for about a week or so, then they shouldn't be there. They're not, it's not safe. It's not safe. It's also, they're not under their own free will, maybe a bit much, but they're definitely under an influence that is not of their own internal influence. That is why they shouldn't be there. And that is why Kirk did the right thing by taking them out of paradise and making them see the real light. Well, so I didn't prove your point. I very nicely presented a piece of evidence on your side. Okay, well, I take that as partly proving my point. Yes, you can use my piece of evidence as for you, and it absolutely is a piece on your side. I have to say something for yeah. a change. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I think that I mean, people start off with ambitions in life, with goals and things that they want to do. And this is a middle-aged man who had set out to find a planet to do something with it and now he, he realizes, I've wasted time. I mean, that's what I've spent my life wanting to do, and I've wasted time. Yeah. I want to get back to my original goal. Absolutely. That is definitely what's happening with Sandoval. Um, and so we pretty much have made the decision that we are going to leave this planet. We're going to go to a star base, and they're going to find another planet, and they can start over. Starting over is really a, in a way of saying starting over, but also continuing. Right. Absolutely. Sure. Agreed. Mm-hmm. We're on the bridge. McCoy enters. And it sounds like one fringe benefit of the spores is that they're still all in perfect health, which, by the way, makes me go, man, why aren't we just re- sending people to this planet to get infected and cure all their health issues? Great point. And then they could leave. Leave. It seems to me the spores were really useful. <laughs> and there was a good thing to know about uh, that we never go back to. Well, that's the second time man's been thrown out of paradise. And this is Kirk's philosophy. He says, No, no, it's this time we walked out on our own. Maybe we weren't meant for paradise. Maybe we were meant to fight our way through, struggle, claw our way up, scratch for every inch of the way. Maybe we can't stroll to the music of the lute. We must march to the sound of drums. That sounds like a Gene Kuhn line, if you ask me. I, I didn't write it, but I could have. Because <laughs> that, that's really what I believe, too. I do believe that life, it's all been uphill. Because it's uphill, you are, are stronger people. Yeah, I agree with that. Weaker people are the ones who just flex and don't have to do anything about it. I totally agree. I don't like particularly the way Kirk says it. It's very militaristic, <laughs> yep. the way he but, says but it. He is, um, but he is, he I, is military. <laughs> right. I absolutely agree that challenges in life is what forms us and that without those challenges, we won't gain our strength. We won't gain our wisdom. We won't all of that. I 100% agree. I 
am concerned that Kirk uses his philosophy and imposes it on other people. That's one thought that I have. And the second thing, and this is something that has actually come to me later in life, I was extremely ambitious, you know, wanted to be a director and a filmmaker, and my career didn't go the way that I wanted it to go. And I think part of me in my 40s and 50s was letting go of achievement in that sense. Not that I don't keep challenging myself, not that I don't want to keep learning and not that I don't work really hard. I do, but going, it's okay. Not everyone actually has to strive forward and achieve achievement. This is what my partner Hoover would say is that achievement is overrated. And the thing that I think I'll give my answer about why I don't think Kirk was right. I think Kirk was right 100% to get his crew back. They swore an oath to the ship and it is mutiny and they can't be allowed to mutiny. They all have responsibilities. But I also think if Layla said, I want to go back to the planet and get bored again, that's her right. It's her free will. She can do that. And, and I think that there's plenty of evidence that it is safe. They've been there three years. Nobody's died. If you can get reinfected by the spores, then the Berthold rays aren't a threat. And I think it's up to each individual to decide if they want to live the spores life or if they want to live the Kirk life. That's my feeling. So, so that's your is that your wrap on this on the episode itself? No, it's just why I think why I disagree with some of what Kirk did. Well, I agree with everything you said. The only thing about the spores and about the Berthold rays is that the Berthold rays were still a threat. Now, they weren't a threat while you were under the influence of the spores, but if you take away the spores, then the threat is very much there and human tissue will break down after about a week. If the, if the planet was not being bombarded by birth rays, then I would be more lenient about the desire to stay on the planet and live under the spores. But I still think that everything that you've talked about with struggle, with uh, you know being driven by being ambitious to achieve things – and I agree with you, Steve. I think you know when you get past your 40s and 50s, your ambition to be successful and, and to, to be so career-driven changes. But I think those goals are replaced by other goals. I don't think that just when we give up certain career goals that we just give up on everything. We just might be like, you know what? Uh, I think I'm going to change course on what I want out of life. But you're still going to work for it. I agree that Kirk is very militaristic in his depiction of that. I think that is very much a Gene Kuhn a quality that that he brought to James Kirk because we've very much seen that side of Kirk, seeing him so brash and almost abrasive uh, and aggressive in some ways in the episodes that, that Gene Kuhn produced and certainly in the episodes that he wrote. But in this case, I think they were right to you know snap him back to reality. You brought up a great point that the crew of the Enterprise mutinied, but they were under the influence right. of drugs. And we, we've, we have seen about the drug culture and the counterculture and the hippie movement in the 60s was it was a great idea, but for the most part, it just didn't work. And it didn't work in the 23rd century either on Omicron SETI 3. I think it did work. It worked perfect. And it doesn't work in the uh, military. No, definitely not in the military. You know, um, I, I was in the military 34 months. And the military, it is not, not a matter of choice. There are rules and you either go by the rules or you're court-martialed. That's why I say it's 100% correct for the crew. I absolutely believe that. And no, it's right. I was almost court-martialed once. Oh, wow. <laughs> well, that is a story I want to find out on another day, maybe. Um, I'll say two super quick things. One is I believe in learning all the time. That's my favorite thing, reading, learning. I think it is one of the most important things for a human to keep learning. I don't think that I have the right to force people that don't believe that to do that. That's the first thing. The second thing is, did you know that there are more cells in your body that are not you than there are cells in your body that are you? And that if I removed them all, you would die. Interesting. Okay. So we are actually always under the influence of things that aren't us. Anyway, let's get to the end of this scene because it is amazing and tragic and painful because Mr. Spock has been quiet uh, and Kirk asks him. We haven't heard much from you about Omicron SETI 3, Mr. Spock. And we hear Ruth's scene. I have little to say about it, Captain. Except that for the first time in my life, I was happy. That is my favorite final line 
of the Star Treks I did. It's great. And it's so sad. And it's so simple. Yeah. In quiet, which proves that drama doesn't have to be loud. Couldn't agree more. Uh, I think it's a beautiful moment. Scott, do we have quotes of what people said about this episode? We talked so much about Jerry Finnerman, and it's so great to talk, Ralph, with you about Jerry Finnerman because Steve and I have s- said so much about Finnerman. But this is what Jerry Finnerman said about you. He said, This Side of Paradise was a well directed show. I thought Ralph Sinensky did a wonderful job with the women in the episodes that he directed, and he had a sensitivity. And he wouldn't compromise either. I liked that about him. So that's from Jerry Finneman. I know his television archive interview. I've seen it. Oh, really? (laughs) The great Dorothy Fontana, who wrote the episode, said, I love it. I thought it worked out really well. And NBC liked it very much. And Gene liked it very much, Gene Roddenberry. So I got to be story editor. And the final word actually came from Leonard Nimoy. In a letter dated January 24th, 1967, Dear Ralph, writes Leonard Nimoy, I would like you to know how much I enjoyed the work that we did together on this side of paradise. It was not only a special Spock experience, but it was special for me as well in that I felt safe in the hands of a capable director. Unfortunately, a rare experience in TV. I sincerely hope that we will spend much more time together on sound stages and locations in the future. Many, many thanks. Sincerely, Leonard Nimoy. Ralph, what do you think when you hear that letter I, to I, you from Nimoy? I, well, I have it on my website. I've, I have included it in the post I did on Paradise. It's very uh, moving to get that kind of a response from your peers, from somebody you've worked with, because I have to tell you, it's a rarity. I'll I'll give sort of my final thoughts about this episode. I love it. I think it's a great episode. And the fact that I disagree a little bit with some of Kirk's choices at the end, that's okay. You're not supposed to agree with what every character does. And what works so well in this episode is emotionally with Spock, it is so darn profound. It is just absolutely beautiful and adds to the incredible emotional complexity that this guy walks around with every single day. It is such, and as we sat there trying to speculate on what is he feeling, what's really happening, and of course, on some level, the most fascinating character in Star Trek is ultimately unknowable. Well, what I think is that this is an episode that just like basically every other episode that we have recorded here on Enterprise Incidents, is it a, it's an episode I have a, a, a great amount of love for, a new appreciation for, seeing it in a new light. And of course, this will always be special because we got to talk about this episode, Ralph, with you by our side on this one. Uh, it is such a, like I said at the top of the episode here, a perfect balance of drama, heart, and humor even has a little bit of action going on. Jill Ireland, just like Eleanor Donahue, gave a magnificent performance in Metamorphosis, showing so much range in in just just a 50-minute episode. Jill Ireland gave a cinematic performance as Layla Colomi in This Side of Paradise. She is wonderful. It is a heartfelt heartbreaking episode, one that is definitely provocative, one that holds up very, very well after 55 years. And Steve, I agree with you completely. You don't have to agree with everything about what what your characters do in an episode, but you could still love the episode as a whole. And Ralph, what are your final thoughts, especially after this conversation about this side of paradise? Well, I, I think to have done an episode, and this applies to any time that you do anything creative, where you send it out and the fact that you get response like we're getting, because you don't get it from, from everything, it takes the script, it takes the, the acting, it, it takes so many things, but to get a response and different responses. I mean, as you said, Steve, some of the things you don't agree with, and yet you're responding to it and emotionally responding to it. And that's the big thing. Irving Thalberg, way, way back in the 30s, said he makes movies for people to feel. 
And that's really what drama is, whether it's stage or screen or written. The main thing that you, you want to do is you want people to understand it, to see it and understand it, but to have a, an emotional reaction to it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. Yes. Well, let me just say, this was the most exciting exploration of an episode we've done. To have you here, Ralph, mm. it just added so much. I felt It felt like it put me on the set in a way that I've never felt like before. Oh, yes, 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 yes. And I hope for everybody out there listening that you had the same experience as Scott and I have. And you could visit us on our Facebook page, do a search for Enterprise Incidents. You can s follow the show at Enter Incidents on Twitter, at Enterprise Incidents on uh, Instagram. Please subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or on YouTube. Uh, leave your comments on YouTube. Please leave your reviews on Apple Podcasts. And if you want to reach me, you can reach me at SR Morris on Twitter, SR Morris one on Instagram. And if you want to listen to my other podcast, The Cinephiles, and maybe you're interested in a little romance, we had some romance here, you could listen to our episodes on When Harry Met Sally or Singing in the Rain or West Side Story, which is a bit tragic like this one is. Scott, how would people find you? Okay, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Movie Mance. And like Steve said, make sure you check out our Enterprise Incidents Facebook page where you can answer the following questions. The first question is, do you agree that Kirk did the right thing to counteract paradise in this side of paradise? That was the first question. The second question is, did Spock and Layla have sex? <laughs> yes. Oh, well, we got it from the director. <laughs> he says yes. <laughs> I would ask a third question too. Would you like to try out the spores? What's your answer, Steve? My answer is absolutely yes. Okay. The question is, would you... A fourth question is, after trying out the spores, would you stay? Would you volunteer to stay on Omicron SETI-3 under the influence of the spores? Or would you be like, nope, I want to I wanna do my own thing with my own free thinking, my own free will, and I would not stay under the influence of the spores? Let us know the answers to all of these questions on our Facebook page, Enterprise Incidents. And please make sure you share this episode of Enterprise Incidents because it is a very special, special moment to have the director of the episode with us. Ralph, where can people find you and read your blog? It was well, not a blog. It's a website. And it's at Sinensky.com. It's called Ralph's Cinema Trek. You can Google that and that'll tell you where to go, or just do Senensky, S-E-N-E-N-S-K-Y dot -E -E com. That'll take you right to it. And there are, I think at this point, about 225 posts. It's absolutely fantastic. For people, A, if you're a Star Trek fan, you must go and check it out. And if you're a filmmaker or interested in the way that TV was made and is made, it's an incredible, incredible resource. Ralph, thank you. I cannot thank you enough. This has been an amazing experience to have this conversation with thank you. Thank you, Ralph. We are so grateful. Thank you so very much for sharing, uh, I want to say, three hours of your time to join us on this super deep dive of This Side of Paradise. And uh, thank you. On top of everything else, Ralph, thank you for listening to our podcast every week and for your comments and for your support. That means the world to us. Thank you so, so very much. And we hope... You had a good time with us today. I did. I did. I did. I did. And coming up next on Enterprise Incidents, we get to the episode that Ralph almost directed himself. That's right. We are doing the Gene Kuhn written masterpiece, The Devil in the Dark. That's next on Enterprise Incidents. Until then, keep going boldly. Boldly.